Christ, we come before you uh, praising you, thanking you for your victory over the grave, for the salvation you won for us, for the divine life that you pour into our souls through your grace. Help us, Lord, to receive the fullness of the grace you have for us and to live from it, to cooperate with your work in our souls, uh, that your power, your love may spread through us to the world. Guide this uh, course, Lord. Breathe your spirit into the depths of our heart and lighten our minds that we might know your ways more. May your saints, John of the Cross, Bernard, and Greg Renissa intercede for us uh, during these weeks and months to draw us into that, that life that they discovered more deeply into your life. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. What's the easiest way just to turn off the projector? Or just the, just like that. I just hit power. <laughs> Do you want it off off? Yeah, I don't think we're able to go, okay, we'll so go back to it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Feliz Kobe Dog for a while. But, um, <laughs> Christmas season. <laughs> but yeah, we, we survived. But you had a little Christmas mass out here. Is that what happened? Yes. Uh, it's, like, uh, Multiple. Multiple Christmas Multiple masses. Well, okay. 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 Right. So, you had your family visits? Mm-hmm. Any glory stories to share from your family visit? Anything uh, awesome happen? Anybody fall at your feet converting to the Lord? <laughs> your witness? <laughs> I have yeah. a, a humble, a humble little story. Yeah. You know, I call it a glory story because all my nieces and nephews are glorious, but nice. Nice. Um, my little niece, Agnes, um, she turned four when I was here. Yeah, cool. So I got to her and all she could say to me First thing she said to me, and last thing she said to me, Ma- hey Maggie, I'm full. I'm full. <laughs> hey Maggie, you know I'm full. <laughs> She's just so proud to be four. But yeah, I feel like each of them, they're just gaining this confidence and becoming like who the Lord is asking them to be, even at such a young age. And um, they're all so different, but just, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's amazing just to watch them grow and to know I'm such a proud aunt of them. I'm like, Please, one priest, at least one priest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that is a glorious story. To be four. To be four. <laughs> if you start admiring, like, the, the way they talk, um, you like stuff to do it yourself. So, I was with the Missionaries of Charity last <laughs> week. And uh, the sacristan, she's, she's from Mexico. And uh, kind of a stocky uh, woman. Um, and but she had uh, she had a little lips l- lips or whatever uh, lips 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 she had a little lisp and so I find and I kind of like found it endearing after a while <laughs> and so now I'm, I find a, a lisp coming out <laughs> then you catch a little lisp I apologize but um, I found this, this sister so endearing in her lisp. <laughs> um, but it, it goes to show like what what you admire you tend to become like and so that's why in this course we're taking uh, as our friends along the journey um, Saints John of the Cross Saint Bernard of Clairvaux and Saint Greg Renissa um, yeah as we admire them uh, we become more like them we become more like them and that's the beautiful thing with these spiritual texts um, about prayer, about their own spiritual lives, is, yeah, these saints open up their interior lives to us. They open up their lives to us, their, their souls. Their intimacy with the Lord is opened up before us, for us to admire and be like, wow, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And by admiring that, then we're, we're drawn into it. 
and we're drawn into it. And so it's not just to learn about them or what they say, uh, but they do draw us into uh, their own kind of relationship with the Lord. Similar experiences. You know, we read, and it's common enough when you read these passages uh, of the saints about prayer, even lofty prayer, there's something in us that resonates with it. Mm-hmm. And we sort of see our own selves in the pages. And it's true. We should. Even as, you know, they're speaking about lofty prayer, and we're just kind of down here, uh, crawling along, there's still something similar. We do possess what they possess. The Trinity dwelling in our souls. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so, yeah, there, there can be a likeness even to the lofty states of prayer. And it, it can encourage us, stir up our hearts uh, to yearn for more, uh, to ask for more, to, to uh, press on for more. And so, yeah, to take these uh, saints as our companions in this, in this uh, class, this course. And that's the beauty, you know, with the Catholic Church, the riches of our faith in the spiritual tradition is that there are always, you know, new friends to meet and to, to go deeper with. Um, you know, it is kind of amazing. Like, I can't see into your soul. You can't see into my soul. Um, but, like, in these writings, we do get to see into their souls, <clears throat> which is pretty amazing. And in charity, we're united to them. <clears throat> in the communion of saints, we share what they share. And yeah, there are so many saints like this in our Catholic tradition. And so the spiritual life uh, never has to grow boring, never has to grow old. This isn't so much your concern now, but just to put this in the back of your mind, um, you know, 20 years from now, you're a sister of life. And if things seem a little slow in the spiritual life or they've kind of mellowed out, you feel like you need something more. Well, just get into one of the, the saints and their writing, someone you haven't discovered yet or you haven't done a deep study of yet. And as you know from just your own, you know, reading like St. Therese's Story of the Soul, like these works can have big changes in our lives. It can really affect our prayer lives and give, give us new life. And so there's always more we can go into. There are new saints we could discover and go deeper with. And so, yeah, I mean, it would be a, a real pity, I think, if a religious through his or her life, you know, never read, you know, or got deeply into St. John of the Cross. There would be something kind of surprising about that. It would be um, sort of a pity, or religious never, through their whole religious life, never got into St. Bernard's Song of Songs and really kind of opened, opened it up and, and entered deeply into it. Um, it would be kind of, even just on a natural level, it would be like, okay, an expert in Russian literature who's never read, like, Dostoevsky. Um, maybe it's okay, maybe they have their, their niche or something, but it would just be a little surprising at first. Oh, really? You've never read Dostoevsky? Oh, or, um, you know, someone who has a business, they never read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People or something. <laughs> They still might, you know, have made millions in their business, but it'd be a little surprise at first. Really? Like, this is your forte, this is your expertise, and you haven't read this classic, that cl- classic? So I think with us uh, as well, it's like, okay, you're religious, you're set apart for prayer in the spiritual life, and you haven't read this or that. It's just, you know, it might be fine with the Lord, but it's just a little surprising at first. And it kind of raises, raises a, a, a question. Or a, it's a, just a surprising thing. Um, and so, but the, we do have all these things in the church to help us. And in different chapters of our life, to have a different saint that's kind of burning uh, in our mind and heart, who's, who's there with us, and who we're kind of getting into a new. And there can be a new freshness that enters our spiritual life through these uh, encounters with different saints and going deeper into their works. So I had, you know, the next, so my, I'm working on, like, Bernard, Bernard, now it's my, <laughs> <laughs> Bernard, Bernard. <laughs> um, so I think I have a couple more years on Bernard. Uh, but then, you know, after him, Francis de Sales, I think, is the next one. So, you know, I've read Introduction to Devout Life, most of it. Um, the Treatise of Divine Love, I've really gotten into. But they really do that deep, full study. I think that's a couple years from now. 
And then Bonaventure, I haven't done like a deep study of Bonaventure yet. And I think he's, so like, you know, maybe five years from now, I'll really get into Bonaventure. Um, and but it's nice to have these, there's so much, there's other people to turn to. Um, and so, yeah, to, uh, to take advantage of what we have in the Catholic Church and the, the full riches of it. And so, yeah, it's great. So this this semester will be much more text-focused. You know, last semester we had Jordan Allman's Spiritual Theology text, which uh, accompanied us. But based on my lectures, we're just kind of um, building on or... My lectures were more like a different look at what um, Jordan Allman was describing or just elaborating upon it, but also bringing in other people. Uh, but this will be much more text-focused. And so uh, as you get the text and you do the, the reading assignments, think too about yeah what you want to bring to, to class as far as a comment or what you found insightful in um, you know, a sermon of St. Bernard that you read that was assigned for, for class or you know questions that came up as you read the text. And so this is going to be partly about uh, learning yeah, how to read these, these spiritual texts to our, our best, greatest benefit. Because, um, yeah, there's so many more in the Catholic Church to help us. And so, yeah, to, to learn how to read these texts. And so we had first semester, last time we had the spiritual theology course, Principles of Spiritual Theology. And we're going to have to call upon what you uh, learned uh, last fall when we read these saints. So you, you weren't tested uh, last year, but your test will come <laughs> as we read these. <laughs> as we read these spiritual texts. And uh, yeah, we'll see this actually, this um, this first, you know, in about, in a few minutes we'll turn to it and you'll have to draw from the, what you learned in the first semester, the question I'll ask you, but... Um, <clears throat> So maybe just to share why St. Bernard. So you know, um, so Gregory of Nyssa is going to be more of a, he's the least important of the, of the three. Um, okay, so here's how it happened. You know, so I've always, for the past 15 years, it's been John of the Cross. You yeah, have my John of the Cross cheat sheet um, <laughs> in those years. Um, so he's been my go-to. He still is. He still is in some ways. And then in the past uh, year, year and a half, but certainly in the last six months, it's really been St. Bernard who's, who's come forward. <clears throat> and I think they're very much compl- complementary. They're very much um, unified. They're in agreement, but they have different emphases. And so I found with St. John of the Cross over these years, you know, really great with helping us in the darkness, abiding when, when uh, the prayer life is difficult, abiding in simple faith, hope and charity, and just being there with the Lord and you know, resting in His presence, a simple gaze of love upon the Lord. And yeah, learning how to make it in, in the darkness and having that purify your faith, that pure, more pure uh, act of faith to find the Lord. So John of the Cross helps us in this time of, of absence, we feel, from the Lord often. Um, but I found, so for a while I've been thinking I need more desire in my spiritual life. Uh, we need contentment. You need to learn to rest in the difficulties and abide patiently waiting for the Lord. Um, but we also need desire as well. And so St. Bernard has come into the picture in my life to kind of stir up the desire more. Uh, stir up the, the desire more. And so it's a nice compliment there. John of the Cross really helping us to learn how to rest in the presence of the Lord and find contentment, whatever our situation. Um, but we don't want to fall asleep there. You, know, you don't want the rest to turn into a stasis. <clears throat> always desiring for more. Always seeking, knocking, asking. And so desire comes really strongly in, in St. Bernard. <coughs> and experience as well. The word experience comes up all the time in St. Bernard. And oftentimes we think of um, experience and spirituality uh, as coming with the Carmelites or like the modern turn or something. 
with a new emphasis on experience and modernity, you know, with Descartes and 15, 1600s onwards. Um, but here we have St. Bernard, a medieval, uh, died 1153, and experience comes up a lot in his word. He uses the word a lot through his writings. I will tell you my own experience, he says. The word has visited me, and he has visited me often. And we're like, wow, yeah, Bernard, tell us more. We want to hear about this experience and enter into it ourselves. <clears throat> but yeah, really this, this sense of, of desire in St. Bernard, but also the visits of the Lord. So John of the Cross, you get used to abiding in the darkness. Um, and you abide there. And maybe you, you stop expecting things from the Lord. And you, ex- you stop expecting prayer to be a two-way street. It becomes just a, a one-way street of just kind of reaching out and waiting, waiting on the Lord. But no, in fact, prayer is a two-way street. <clears throat> it's a living relationship. We, we ask, but we also... Um, he answers. We speak, but we also listen. Uh, we knock, uh, but the door opens uh, sometimes. We seek, but he also seeks us. <clears throat> and so prayer is this two-way street, and St. Bernard helps bring that out, the visits of the Lord, the activity of the Lord in our, our life of prayer. John of the Cross sometimes can be interpreted in almost like a Christian deis, deism, almost as a Christian deism. Um, and so a couple academics have done this strongly. Remy Brog, um, his recent book, maybe the past five years, The God of the Christians and a couple others, I think it's called. Um, and he has a couple chapters in, about St. John the Cross in there. But he turns John the Cross into a Christian deist. Um, so deism is the clockmaker God. So he makes the world, sets it in process, but then is no longer intimately involved with the world. That's the God of deism. Okay, he explained why the world's created, but he's not intimately involved with it. <clears throat> he kind of just lets, lets it be. And so what I mean by, so I, John of the Cross, people can turn him into kind of a practical Christian deism. They wouldn't describe it this way, but it can become practically like a Christian deism. I'm not expecting anything from the Lord, to hear anything from the Lord, uh, to, um, to have God act in my life. We have the scriptures, we have the sacraments, we have faith, um, and that that's all we have. And we shouldn't expect anything else. And you kind of close down the two-way street that way. So St. Bernard frees us from kind of a, a tendency of turning John the Cross into a, a Christian deist. Uh, Dennis Turner has a, a book, like The Darkness of God or something Christian, the negative um, theology and Christian spirituality. He has a chapter on John the Cross. Same thing, turns him into a Christian deist. Um, so we want to avoid that. So, you know, I kind of, part of my stasis in the spiritual life uh, was kind of involved that, uh, kind of a more practical kind of Christian deist. I'm kind of painting things in broad strokes here. but um, <clears throat> And so to have St. Bernard, uh, to have desire, uh, have that element, to expect the Lord to visit. Visits from the Lord. And in fact, when we read John on the cross more closely, we see uh, he's expecting these things as well. Like he has all these, and well, we'll look at this, Spiritual Canticle 1, which you know I love, which we talked about um, last, a couple months ago. Um, but we didn't turn to the end of Spiritual Canticle 1, and it's about the visits of the Lord in John on the cross. The people miss that. Um, and so in St. Bernard, we, we see that, uh, yeah, the Lord is much, very much a living and acting God who still speaks. And we'll see the various ways God speaks and what that means uh, as St. Bernard describes it. But uh, St. Bernard lays out, you know, the, the parallel between, or the image of Mary and Martha. Mary's used for the contemplative life, and then Martha, an image of the active life. And the saints, you know, call us to be uh, both Mary and Martha. So to be that contemplative life combined, mingled with the active life, contemplatives in the world. Well, St. Bernard says, um, yeah, don't be simply Mary and Martha. Be the whole household. You also need Lazarus. 
And he takes Lazarus as a type of someone who is pleading, desiring, seeking, asking, knocking. He's under this, this stone in the tomb. And he's pleading to be let out. Uh, you know, as, as a type of that kind of uh, pleading, asking, seeking, desiring, <clears throat> yearning. And maybe Lazarus was, I mean, his soul was still alive when his body was dead, so maybe he was pleading even there. But anyway, this is, it's an image. Um, and that's kind of the fullness of the prayer life, to be Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Pleading with the Lord for more. Knocking. Asking to be delivered from this, delivered from death, to share more in his life. And so, St. Bernard opens us up to, to that element of the spiritual life. That this need to seek, ask, and, and knock. And we find all this in St. John the Cross as well, but it's, it's, it's not as emphasized in St. John the Cross. So like in St. John the Cross, Spiritual Canticle 13, 2, he says, The visits and favors of the Lord are generally in, in accord with the intensity of yearnings and ardors of love that precede them. So the intensity of our yearnings, our desires, our knocking, our seeking, the intensity of our yearnings and the ardors of our love prepare the way for the visits of the Lord, the favors of the Lord. And the visits and favors of the Lord normally come um, in accord with the intensity of yearnings and uh, desires that, that precede them. And so it is in John the Cross as well, <clears throat> but we, we find it emphasized a little bit more in St. Bernard. So it's just a way that they complement one another. On this feast day of the conversion of St. Paul, we can think about um, life in Christ, which is so important for St. Paul and Christ living in us. And we heard this in the, the song we, we just sang, the resurrected king is resurrecting me. Um, to have Christ's life in us, and how to nourish that life, how to cooperate with that life. Um, the mystics help us to enter into that. That interiority of uh, God's life dwelling in us. And the mystics t show us how to open up space for that. How to come in resonance, harmony with, with it. How to cooperate with the life of grace in our souls. <clears throat> and so it's very much Pauline in a way. Okay, Christ is living in us. You know, I, um, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what does that look like to allow the life of Christ to live in you more, to live through you? And the mystics uh, open up that interiority for us and show us how to let that life take over more and more. Um, and so it's very much... Pauline, what we're, what we're up to here and going deeper into that. St. Bernard, too, with these visits, he's, he's so attentive into like uh, the various ways God comes to us and visits us. And I have a list of maybe just kind of as I read him, 25 at least different ways that he sees the Lord coming to us. <laughs> in these visits. And he's very attentive to it, the visits of the Lord. So he helps us to be attentive to all the different ways the Lord comes to us in grace, in his love. All the different ways we can encounter the Lord. St. Bernard helps us to be attentive to it, aware of it. And we might say, well, you know, it's a little too much at first in St. Bernard. Probably two-thirds of his sermons on Song of Songs, he speaks about the comings and goings of the Lord, the visits of the Lord. Uh, certainly over half, probably like two-thirds, he at least mentions somewhere in the sermon about the visits of the Lord, the comings and goings of, of the Lord. And we can misunderstand him and take it to be like, oh, he's just all about, uh, he's after just a spiritual experience or something. Uh, no, he's after the Lord <laughs> and the ways the Lord comes. And he talks about the sweetness of the Lord. Um, and we, yeah, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more later. But it's not just a savory experience he's, he's after. Yeah, he wants more of the Lord, and the Lord himself is sweetness. So it's, it's more an objective, kind 
kind of sweetness that he's after. The Lord himself is good. He brings his goodness when he comes to us. <clears throat> and so, yeah, these visits of the Lord, St. Bernard helps us to be more attentive to them. Inspirations of grace. Right? We're probably hit with, you know, a hundred inspirations from God, you know, just in the last few hours since we've been awake today. Uh, but how attentive are we to them? And St. Bernard helps us to, to listen. And to, to be aware of them. <clears throat> and we start, you know, as in your religious life, as postulants. Um, you know, we're starting with kind of these giants. And we're starting uh, on them uh, as they speak about, you know, the Song of Songs and the most intimate love um, with, with the Lord, of the Lord. Um, so someone could say, well, shouldn't you be starting somewhere else? Um, well, we did start with spiritual theology, uh, but <laughs> um, but no, this is a good place to start, actually. So, I think I shared this before, but uh, Father Francis Martin, um, who died in the odor of sanctity about five years ago or so, this is how holy he was. So, I had him for a few classes at the Dominican House of Studies, a scripture scholar, and. Um, he, so he was probably in his mid to late 70s when I had him in class. And uh, one Lent, he, um, he, did, he was doing a lot of traveling, preaching, retreat preaching and things like that. One Lent, he, at an airport, he had a hamburger uh, that gave him food poisoning. Uh, this is like the beginning of Lent. And then for the whole rest of Lent, he, he couldn't eat anything <laughs> because of that. I don't know what he had or what. I mean, it was intense, this food poisoning. Uh, I think he, he, he probably, I'm assuming he had soup or something. But no, he just, all of that, he couldn't eat, eat solid food. Uh, he had in his class a few times. Um, and he's already, you know, kind of a, an old, sickly man. <clears throat> and, you know, we can see the natural causes of that. Okay, this hamburger he had. <laughs> um, but I think we see what's going, what was going on there. Uh, all of Lent, and then at the end of Lent, he comes out of it. And so the Lord was, was drawing him a deeper into his passion, a deeper share in his passion. Um, just, just to show kind of a hint of the holiness this man had. Um, and when I think of, when I think of spiritual marriage, and as we saw last, last semester, spiritual marriage is something we're all called to and that people do attain in this life. And we've all have surely met one or two people who have, who have been living spiritual marriage in this life. And so he's one that I kind of identify, like, yeah, he was there. He was there. Um, you know, he still had, you know, even in spiritual marriage, you, you go deeper, there's places to grow. Um, but, you know, he was, he was basically there. Holy man. And he said when uh, he started religious life as a Trappist, he joined at like age 19, he said he knew nothing at all um, about you know, the faith, about the spiritual life. He's this young Trappist novice. And the first thing the novice master gives him to read uh, is St. John of the Cross. And a living flame of love by St. John of the Cross. Uh, so about the heights of the spiritual life, the greatest intimacy with the Lord, is what his novice master gives him to read, this young 19-year-old who knows nothing. And he said uh, that that marked the rest of his spiritual life. Uh, because it kind of gave him a concrete sense of what he was after. And just as importantly, it fueled this desire in his heart for intimacy with the Lord, this desire to pursue the Lord, to go through the sufferings it takes to reach this intimacy with the Lord. You need a lot of desire to keep going. To put forth the spiritual efforts, effort that's needed, discipline, asceticism, practices that you devote yourself to. You need a, a lot of desire for this intimacy with the Lord. And living flame of love kind of implanted that in his heart from the beginning. And it keeps us focused on that one thing necessary. So as you become novices, you know, you'll have more, you'll enter more kind of fully uh, into religious life and all our, the religious practices associated with the Sisters of Life and in your rule of life. You'll enter into that more fully. 
right? And we know it's all order towards love. It's all order towards love. Uh, but you know, we could lose sight of that uh, easily. We can just kind of get caught up in the routine, or you can just caught up in just getting the things just right or something. And so it's good at the beginning to enter in uh, with kind of this taste of love. And this is all about love, what, what I'm doing, what I'm entering into more fully. It's all about growing more deeply in this intimacy with the Lord and love and charity for my sisters as we press on together towards the Lord. <clears throat> so yeah, that's where we're starting in this most important place so that your whole religious life will be shaped by it. Right, and you you get out of it what you put into it, and so yeah, you know, spend some time with these texts, your reading assignments, because <clears throat> they are rich. There's there's a lot there. Spend time with them, pray with them, and let them mark these uh, first steps of your religious life. And you won't be disappointed. They won't let you down. Now, um, sermon on the the Song of Songs. So, okay, so John of the Cross. I thought, okay, I want to do something with John of the Cross, and then oh, then Saint Bernard is in my life now. Uh, <laughs> Bernard, Bernard. Um, and then, um, so I thought, you know, well, that's kind of random. Okay, we could do a course on just Saint Bernard. All right, we could do a course Saint Bernard and Saint John of the Cross, and that would be fine. Uh, but it's kind of random why I bring those two together. And so I thought, okay, well, what one way that they're brought together is the Song of Songs commentary. They both have, you know, they're, they're both at their best when they're writing their commentaries on the Song of Songs, Spiritual Canticle and St. John the Cross and St. Bernard's uh, 86 uh, homilies on the Song of Songs. Um, and so I thought, okay, that's a good way to bring them together. And then I thought, okay, well, um, Gregor of Nyssa also has a nice commentary on uh, Song of Songs. So I thought, okay, so that, that can be the, the guiding thread, kind of the unifying uh, thing, is uh, these great saints commenting on the Song of Songs. And we have a church father, a medieval, and then we have a modern, or early modern. So it's a nice way to get a good taste of a church father, patristic on this, uh, someone from the Middle Ages, and then someone from the early modern period. Um, <clears throat> so, but yeah, Gregor Nyssa will be the, the least, he'll be the least of our focus. Um, so, and it is, you know, a Song of Songs, that commentary on the Song of Songs for the, the church fathers, for those in the Middle Ages, Song of Songs really kind of captured what our relationship of love with the Lord is all about, what it's like. You know, to go into what's what's the depths of the spiritual life about, you know, basically they would go to the Gospels, the Psalms, and Song of Songs. That's kind of where they went. So Song of Songs became this, yeah, um, image of, yeah, you want to know what intimacy with the Lord looks like, you want to know what that loving relationship looks like, uh, you read Song of Songs, and you read it in the spirit. You read it and seeing uh, how these things point to the love of, of God for, for Israel, the love of God for his church, um, that, that marriage, spiritual marriage between Christ and his bride, the church, that St. Paul speaks about in Ephesians 5. Um, and human marriage reflects that marriage between Christ and the church. And so, yeah, you know, these, so all of them, when they begin their commentaries, uh, especially early on, Greg Nissa and the other church fathers who comment on the Song of Songs, they're like, you know, be careful. Don't read it in a sensual way. Don't read Song of Songs in a fleshly way. Have to be purified um, and read it in a spiritual way. Uh, and to see in it the resonances of, of love between the soul and, and God. So the, the church fathers, uh, like Gregor Nyssa, Origen, 
they, they saw uh, the wisdom books, they saw Proverbs are for beginners, uh, Ecclesiastes for the, the proficient, and then Song of Songs for, for, for the perfect. Um, and so I guess I could give you a whole semester on Proverbs, but I think that would get kind of boring. <laughs> and we don't have the, the saints commenting so heavily on Proverbs. Um, Ecclesiastes would be kind of fun. Vanity of vanities, so all things are vanity. Um, but anyways, no, this is, I think we are where we, yeah, so the Song of Songs, it, it was seen as, it had, you know, Middle Ages, Church Fathers, uh, what that intimate relationship of love with the Lord looks like, you find in the Song of Songs, and the saints as they comment on the Song of Songs. And in fact, we're not going to get too much into the Song of Songs itself as a, as a book or something, but more just as the, the spiritual principles and insights that John of the Cross and St. Bernard and Gregory and this, uh, draw from them. Um, but just down in this first class, maybe we should just talk a little bit about uh, the Song of Songs. There, there's some debates on um, like what the original intention of Song of Songs was. You know, the person or the people who wrote Song of Songs, what what did they intend by it? Was it just a human love song? Or did they also, or did was it primarily, did they see it too as an allegory of the love between God and the soul? Um, and so there's actually, there's still a debate about it. Um, you know, one art, so some say, uh, no, it's just, you know, it's a collection of human uh, love songs drawn together. Um and then later it develops this allegorical reading. So we get a lot into the reading of scripture here too and the, the four senses of scripture. So this is in the catechism. You can find a good section on it in scripture and tradition. But the four senses of scripture, you have the literal sense and then you have three spiritual senses that are built on the literal sense. And this is how the church fathers read the scriptures. This is how um, the the Middle Age monks uh, read the Middle Age monks. The monks of the Middle Ages. Uh, <laughs> um, how they read the scriptures um, with the spiritual sense. And then as moderns with the historical critical method, we've have kind of lost that. Uh, but in the mid-1900s, there was a sense among Catholics, no, we need, we need with the insights of historical scholarship, we also need um, the spiritual senses of scripture as well. We need to read the scriptures more like the church fathers did. And so Song of Songs kind of gets us into the heat of that debate, or kind of the, the, um, the heart of it. So you have the literal sense, you know, what the author, just, you know, just the face value text, and then three spiritual senses are built on it, the allegorical, which sees the text in light of Christ. So especially think about the Old Testament, how this foreshadows Christ. That's the allegorical sense. And then you have uh, the moral sense, what this says to us about our moral lives or our spiritual lives. Um, and what it says about our spiritual lives. So for instance, in the crossing of the Red Sea, it says something about baptism and us leaving the slavery of Egypt and entering into the, the promised land through the desert. So that's the, the moral or the tropological sense of scripture. And then the last is the anagogical sense, uh, which in Greek is to lead upwards, to lead upwards, on a, upwards, uh, a go, go get, go ga or something, uh, to lead. Uh, anagogical sense, <clears throat> the the eschatological sense, what it says about heaven and the last things, and where where we're being drawn up to. <clears throat> so those are the four senses of scripture, and yeah, the, the church fathers read the scriptures in that way all over the place, and the Song of Songs especially. <clears throat> so one view says, okay, Song of Songs was original, originally um, a love song of Solomon. Or maybe a collection of love songs from different people that were later brought together. Um, and then later, uh, it's read in this allegorical sense. And allegorical in this way just means in light, using the spiritual senses of Scripture. 
So that's, that's one view. The second view is that, no, the, the original intent of the author was to have this be an allegory, to use this language. And the, the original author intended it to, to point to Israel's uh, love relationship with the Lord. Right? Because other Old Testament books do the same thing. Hosea uses um, human love to show the relationship between God and Israel. Um, Ezekiel as well, there are, there are sections, like Ezekiel 16, I think, or 13, 16, I think. Um, <clears throat> and so it was, no, they intended that. And you know, one argument is, I mean, look at all the different ways the, the lover is described, you know, he couldn't be actually all these things. Is he a little shepherd boy? Is, is he that young shepherd man? <laughs> is he that young shepherd or is he like the king? You get kind of both these kind of images in Song of Songs and how could they all um, apply to one person, to one real person? And so, no, it's meant as an allegory for, from the beginning. Um, so, whatever is, is the case for the original composition of Song of Songs, it doesn't matter much. Because by the, the book, by Song of Songs being received into the canon of, of the scriptures, um, it's given that um, orientation to the, to the Lord and the relationship of God with his people. Just by the very fact that it gets taken up into the canon of the scriptures shows that it tells us something about God. Right? It's not just... Um, love poems that the scriptures include. But no, it tells us something about the Lord and our relationship with Him. Um, let me see how... But there's a good quotation here about that. From the point, and, and by the way, it's not just Christians who begin to read the song. Who read? It's not just Christians who read the Song of Songs in this way. The rabbis were doing it before the Christians. Um, so, to modern readers, any attempt to regard the Song Song of Songs as pertinent to sacred history or divine love can seem astonishingly detached from its literal sense. Well, from the point of view of the rabbis and church fathers of late antiquity, the possibility of interpreting the song as anything but divine would have been unthinkable. Why else would the Song of Songs be included in Scripture if not to serve as a key to the mysteries of the human-divine bond, that the human-divine relationship? And in fact, you know, the, he notes that those who do comment on the Song of Songs and, and, alleg and using allegory they are very much attuned to the exhilarating metaphorical play in the Song of Songs. Right? I mean, just the images themselves are kind of allegorical that are used in, in, the, in the love poem to express the, the sentiments of love, the affections of love. And, and so already in the text itself, just with its use of poetic images, you're already kind of in that realm, realm of allegory. So it's no stretch to do what um, St. Berger does and things like that. So one of the, the first um, commentary, Christian commentaries, okay, well, no, the first. Let me start with the Jewish. Um, a key figure in the history of the Song of Songs uh, interpretation uh, is uh, this rabbi. His name is Rabbi Akiva. So he, um, he wrote an important comment. He commented a lot on Song of Songs. And so basically he was born 50 years uh, B.C. Um, no way. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 50 years after Christ. No, so 50, uh, 50 to 135. Um, but anyway, so he, he had a, important commentaries on, on the Song of Songs. And he helped kind of prepare the way for Christians reading the Song of Songs in this way. 
And he said, uh, he has this beautiful line that... So he plays on the word that, um, okay. The one remnant of this debate is Rabbi Akiba's memorable declaration that the whole world is not worth the day on which the Song of Songs was given to Israel. For all their writings are holy, and the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. So he's playing on this, this theme of Song of Songs and holy of holies. And everything that came before is, is like nothing compared to the Lord giving Song of Songs to Israel. This beautiful love poem, this, this beautiful opening up what the love relationship of Israel with the Lord is to be like. And God's love for his people. And it's sort of the, a high point in, in Revelation. Um, he who thrills his voice in chanting the Song of Songs... Um, opens up to the world to come. Opens up to, to what, what's to come in the next world. Um, yeah, so we see Jewish rabbis commenting on the songs of songs this way. And the, the first Christian, um, or at least the, the commentary that we still have, so Hippolytus did a commentary on Song of Songs, um, but then also Origen. Origen is kind of the the first big Christian figure to, to comment on the Song of Songs. And we have uh, most, we have a good portion of it still. Um, and, same, and then after Origen, you have Jerome comments on the Song of Songs, Ambrose comments on the Song of Songs, Gregory the Great does. And then into the Middle Ages, all these medieval monks do. So St. Bernard uh, would have known Origen's commentary on the Song of Songs. He refers to Origen sometimes in his homilies. Um, so he, he knew Origen, he read him. Um, and so you, you see, so you know, we can think about these people commenting on Song of Songs, and we might think it's kind of random at first, uh, that um, this level of interpretation you know, can, can be random. You know, how did they get from um, the flowers of the lily to, you know, speaking about virtue or something? How do they make that jump? It can seem just kind of random um, to interpret these symbols in that way. But you see over time that all these different commentaries, they like tend to like line up uh, and speak, interpret things in a similar way. And we'll, we'll see a case of that, an instance of that, where St. Bernard and St. Origen are just like right, right on the, the same kind of wavelength as they're interpreting the let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Um, and so you see over time that there is almost a canonical interpretation of this book. Like they're, they're just 10, and you, and you see what the interpretation is, and you're like, yeah, like on, on a good day, that's, you know, that's what I would have come up with too or something. Like, <laughs> or it just makes sense. It makes sense. It makes sense. And this is a helpful resource. Um, the Church's Bible series. And so it's drawing together. Um, so this is on Song of Songs. Song of Songs interpreted by early Christian and medieval commentators. And so you do get to see what, you know, a particular verse. You get to see what Gregory the Great says about it. Gregory of Nyssa. Theodore of Cyrus. Origen. Apollinarius of Laodicea, uh, Ambrose of, of Milan, the Gloss Ordinaria, St. Bernard, William of St. Thierry, Nihilus of Ancria. And you're like, who are these? Uh, who knows? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rupert of Deutz, a uh, medieval monk. Bernard of Clairvaux, Honorius of Autun. <clears throat> and you get to see yeah, what they're all saying about a particular verse, and you see similarity. I mean, there are still differences, and people kind of do their own thing with, with the text or the Holy Spirit's guiding them. Mm -hmm. But you, 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 you do see kind of a standard reading of a lot of these texts. <clears throat> Let, so when do you all... 
Um, but so let's talk about the spiritual interpretation of Scripture, because this can shape the way we read the Scriptures too. I mean, what do you, um, is it good to read the Scriptures in this way? What are some of the pitfalls? What are the benefits of it? When you read the Scriptures, do you um, think, do you interpret, does the Holy Spirit guide you to see things uh, in light of <clears throat> allegory Christ, <clears throat> in light of your moral life, how it re- relates to the next life in a theological sense, um, do you, in your own spiritual reading, do you <clears throat> utilize the spiritual senses? <clears throat> or what's your reaction to it? I guess is what I'm asking. <clears throat> As moderns, we're kind of encouraged not to (coughs) go in this direction. (coughs) Because it can seem just like trivial (coughs) eisegesis. You're just reading your own meaning into the text. Um, But no, this is how the church has read the scriptures for for ages. And so we shouldn't be fearful of it. And, um, you know, what you do in your own private Lectio Divina, <laughs> you can be a lot freer and adventurous <coughs> in reading the text these ways. But, um, but yeah, when you come to Psalm 45, <coughs> and um, you come to Psalm 45, and in fact you see the New Testament you know, interprets the Old Testament in, in light of Christ, which is the allegorical sense. Of scripture, so they're all there. Um, and so, yeah, we should be emboldened to read the scriptures this way. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. Psalm 45, I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. Yeah, and of course you should think of, of Christ in these next lines. You are you are the most <clears throat> handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips because God has blessed you forevermore. Gird your sword on your thigh, almighty one, in your splendor and majesty. And so forth, and he rides on. Um, your throne, O God, is forever. The scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of, ri- of righteousness. <clears throat> Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Yeah, we should think about Christ when we read that. How could we not? It's so natural. Mm-hmm. It's so spontaneous. And then we come to the second part. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people in your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. We should think of Mary when we come something like that. We should think of, you know, this is more the moral sense, the tropological. You should think about yourselves in religious life. You just had your family visit. And the Lord is, is calling you. <clears throat> you know, not that that relationship with the family ever ends, but he is, he's also saying something like this to you. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people in your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. You know, there's, there's a detachment, there's a moving away from that. So you can be more devoted to, to the Lord. Now you won't have as much time to visit your family, these kinds of things. You should hear these words spoken to you as well, as you enter into religious life. Because they do, I mean, the Lord speaks to us today through his words, through his word, the holy word of God. And um, so these things do, do apply to us. <clears throat> Okay. I'm going to do better this time with, with time. <laughs> I will. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, so it's Song of Songs. Um, a love song. And it does capture it's just the different elements of love. And the affectivity of love. And the different kind of dynamics of love. Presence, absence, comings and goings, yearnings, finding, delighting in, uh, thinking about the beloved all, all the time. Um, all the, the words that it's hard to capture love, what love is. And so, you know, drawing in like the fragrance of the flower, like the cinnamon, like this or that. And so, um, <clears throat> so yeah, we, we need something like the Song of Songs to really get at what this relationship of love with the Lord looks at, looks like, and is about, and enter into it more, more fully. 
And we need the saints to come alongside of us to open this up before us, uh, to help us to appreciate these things in, in, in a spiritual way. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we'll that's what we'll do. Um, of course, and yeah, focusing on especially Saint John the Cross and Saint Bernard. And I'll just leave you with this note as we conclude. Um, you know, as we think about these, this intimacy that the Lord is calling us to and these heights that John of the Cross and St. Bernard attained, we can be like, you know, really, Lord, is that, is that for me? Uh, is that, um, you know, me so enmeshed in sin? And uh, But no, listen to what St. Bernard says. Uh, we've, he has he's spoken about in the sermons before this us being in the image and likeness of God and by the very fact of being in God's image and likeness we have a capacity for him a capability for him we have a sort of a, alliance with him we're open to this relationship <clears throat> and so that means we're, we're open to this intimacy of love with him so St. Bernard says this is uh, Sermon 83 I have spent the time allotted me in showing the affinity between the word and the soul. The affinity between God, the second person of the Trinity, and the soul. What was the value of all that labor? Surely this. We have seen how every soul, even if burdened with sin, even if enmeshed in vice, ensnared by the allurements of pleasure, a captive in exile, caught in the mud, fixed in the mire, bound to its members, a slave to care, distracted by business, afflicted with sorrow, wandering and strained, filled with anxious forebodings and uneasy suspicions. A stranger in a hostile land, and according to the prophet, sharing the defilement of the dead, encountered with those who go down into hell. Every soul, I say, standing thus under condemnation without hope, has the power to turn and find it can not only breathe the fresh air of the hope of pardon and mercy, but also dare to aspire to the nuptials of the word. Not fearing to enter into alliance with God or bear the sweet yoke of love with the king of angels, why should it not venture with confidence into the presence of him by whose image it sees itself honored and in whose likeness it knows itself made glorious? Yeah, so the Lord calls each each of us and we need to dare to aspire to the nuptials of the word this spiritual marriage with the Lord, this wedding feast with the Lord. And he'll give us the grace as our desire is is kindled more and more for this intimacy with the Lord. And John of the Cross and St. Bernard would help us uh, to get there. All right, so we'll take our little break now.